Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, something called the data context and interaction paradigm or DCI. This is something I've been working on for 10 or 15 years with uh, Trigvi Rianskog. Uh, Trigvi is the inventor of model view controller. And he was at, uh, at Park Place Systems when he invented MVC and uh, was working with Alan Kay's group. And in, in later years, he, he realized that though he had, to, he had solved the kind of visual part of programming that he really hadn't uh, addressed the, oh, shall we say the behavioral part or the coding part. And, and looking at object-oriented programming, he, he, he and, and I agree that uh, we've really lost Alan Kay's vision that what we call object-oriented programming today is, is really just data abstraction. And so abstract data types and object-oriented programming are really two different things. Um, but in, in the modern world, um, most people equate them and there's, there's very, very few people who differentiate them. And it matters. Um, and the reason it matters to me as an agile guy, so I'll put on my agile hat, is that agile is about individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And when I think about that, I don't think about the development team interactions. I think about the interactions between the end user and the computer, because that's what the goal of object-oriented programming was, is to extend the human mind into the computer. So the computer becomes an extension of the self into the environment, into other people's worlds, into the library. Um, so that the computer becomes a tool and an extension of self rather than a tool for making tools, which is what data abstraction is about. So I want to start with a, start with a short table here, um, very, very quickly comparing three things. One is abstract data types. So these are things like complex numbers or windows or files, all these things that we've been taught in, in university are abstract data types. And they're a programming concept. The concept state, they, they encapsulate state and behavior, which are programming concepts. Um, Objects are the locus of aggregate behavior. So we'll talk about a string as being the abstract data types that encapsulates all the behaviors associated with string. And they tend to be compile time bound. So there's no polymorphism. <clears throat> Object-oriented programming, as it is originally conceived, but, but not as how, how people think it, I mean, most people think of what object-oriented programming is, is abstract data types with polymorphism or abstract data types with inheritance. So in object-oriented programming, in Alan Kay's vision, there are no data. There are only objects and objects are loci of behavior. And what object-oriented programming is, and if you only remember one thing from this presentation, this is it. What object-oriented programming is, is a style of creating software for creating networks of cooperating objects that work together to solve some problem for the end user. So if your design unit is not a, a network of cooperating objects, you are not doing object-oriented programming. So this is an architecture conference. If your architecture is a class hierarchy, you're not doing object-oriented programming. If your programming is based on test-driven development, or thinking in terms of one object at a time, you are not doing object-oriented programming because you're missing this whole notion of the network of cooperating objects. And the binding is essentially at runtime and deferred to the last microsecond in object-oriented programming. So in DCI, we have kind of a mixture of these two, but this was really Alan Kay's vision where object-oriented programming is going to live in a new concept that we build called a context. So a context is an object that encapsulates a use case. It's going to be what sets up the objects to cooperate with other in some use case to solve some problem. And then instead of individual objects or, or thinking in classes, we think in terms of networks of objects. And that's what a context is, is a network of objects. And the whole thing has some aggregate behavior. 
like like find a route through a network or or play a video game or something like that, which will be some network of cooperating objects. And the use case relationships are compile time bound. We still have a little bit of, I'm sorry, use case relationships are, are, are compile time bound. So we can reason statically about the entire process. So we go beyond being able to reason statically about a class. Um, to be able to reason statically about the whole use case and to be able to read the code and read the use case in the code. The, the big thing that got us into this is that if you, look, if you read your current object-oriented code, you can't find the use case. You cannot go through the code and trace the sequence of execution. And the reason is polymorphism. So polymorphism is go-tos on steroids. So if you make a call to another object and it says, you know, implement, the, you know, call the bar method of object foo, I mean, you have no idea where the program counter is going to go because there are 20 functions in your system in that inheritance hierarchy, all of which are called bar. And you don't know when that call takes place at runtime, which one of them is going to get called. So you cannot reason about the functional correctness of your code. All you can do is reason about the correctness in isolation, totally context-free of f any class. And that's almost useless. It's like unit testing. Um, just having a bunch of things that pass unit tests is no guarantee that the entire system will work when you put it together. But that's, that's what object-oriented programming is today. So we need to move beyond this. Another reason for this is that if we just think about what software development is, we think of what, what, what clients ask for. They don't so, come to us and say, hey, I want this class, or hey, I want this object. They say, I want to be able to run this process. I want to be able to solve this problem. So what we deliver to customers are use cases. We don't deliver them classes. We don't deliver them objects. So in in, in most businesses, use cases, fly this plane, play this game, um, organize these database entries, is in terms of, of use case results rather than some primitive operation on an object. Um, it's absolutely impossible to find a use case in Java code. I mean, Java has split its, its polymorphism API or kind of the, split the reflection API um, Java is the only programming language in which you cannot do object-oriented programming. You can fake it pretty good in C++. Uh, it's beautiful in Ruby. You simply can't do it in Java. All you can do is abstract data types and class-oriented programming, which is you know, what Barbara Liskoff did with, with abstract data types many, many years ago. So we want to enable this vision of, of Alan Kay. Um, abstract data types are just about the behaviors of individual objects. So abstract only means, I mean, there's nothing abstract about them. They're concrete, they're perfectly concrete. Um, but what we try to do is remove the user of an abstract data type from the details of the implementation. So we encapsulate the implementation. And in fact, abstract data type is probably a, uh, a bad word. It was either Doug McElroy or uh, Brian Kernahan, I can't remember which, that in C++ called them concrete data types. And there's nothing abstract about them. I mean, they, they run, they work. Um, and inheritance is just basically a fancy way of doing pound include. Uh, it's a way of, of smashing some pieces of code together and a, a very few rules about defaults. Um, we think there's classification power and, and, and hierarchical power in inheritance. And yeah, there, there's, there's some ability to organize things and, and maybe there's a little bit of benefit there, but first of all, the world is not hierarchical. The world is as it is. And I mean, hierarchy is, an, is a structure we impose on it to be able to think about things using our left brain. Because our left brain loves classification. It loves total classification. It loves hierarchies. It loves, you know, 
non-overlapping subsets, and that's what inheritance is. But that isn't how the real world works. And the goal of object-oriented programming was to match how our mind thinks about the real world with the code. So the code becomes an extension of our mind. So inheritance and hierarchy is just an implementation technique. Uh, multiple inheritance is an experiment gone bad. It simply doesn't work. I mean, it simply doesn't work in C++. That's a whole other talk. Um, and I mean, you really don't have it in Java. No, don't, don't tell me about Java interfaces. That is not multiple inheritance. So there's something very, very wrong. I mean, really fundamentally wrong about the way we've been approaching programming since the 1980s. Um, and I mean, Alan Kay and a few of his cohorts and people like Trigvi Rianskog have known this, but the whole C++ and Smalltalk and Java tide has overwashed them. I mean, even Smalltalk doesn't do this right. And I mean, at one point, Alan Kay said, hey, let's throw away the Smalltalk tapes. I mean, this is awful. This stuff is crap. But uh, his programmers were very enamored with it. And so uh, they kept it and uh, the rest is history. So what I learned about this was from Trigvir Janskog, um, who I said is the model view controller guy. And, uh, and since then, I've been doing some, some research with people at Rensselaer, Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute as well. And we'll talk about some of their results a little bit later here. So the two problems that I'm, just to you know, summarize what I've said, the first problem is, we don't write objects, we write classes, not most people. There are a few people who do object-oriented programming. How many of you are JavaScript programmers? JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language, or at least it was until they introduced classes. But most of the rest of us think of one class that is a data locale at a time, and we can't reason about the code structure of a use case. We don't know where that hypergalactic go-to is going to go. So even if your world is perfect, we're going to have to go through this context switch between understanding the current class and understanding other classes that we want to work with. Um, the second problem is that we focus on one object at a time. So we do test-driven development or unit testing. Unit, you can't test a class. All you can test is a method. So in, in thinking about one method at a time, we're creating bottom-up procedural hierarchies. And by the way, all the research data substantiate this. There's a lot of papers published on this. Um, TDD basically destroys your architecture because it, it empirically leads to a bottom-up procedural architecture. This has been measured. This has been published. Um, there's very sound theory behind this. So, I mean, a lot of the current practices make this make this work. Um, so polymorphism means that we can focus on the methods of only one class at a time. That's this hypergalactic go-to problem because, uh, well, we don't know where it's going to go. That, that decision is deferred until runtime. So this might strike you as a little bit extreme, but, but this is Alan Kay's vision is that Object-oriented programming is about use cases. It's about a network of cooperating objects solving a problem. And here's a quote from Alan Kay. If we look at the whole history, we see that the proto-OOP stuff started with abstract data types, had a little fork toward what I call objects, and that led to small talk and so forth. But after that little fork, the computer science establishment pretty much did abstract data types and wanted to stick with the data, data procedure paradigm. So object orientation got lost um, very, very early on, probably by the early 1980s. What I want to do is, is go through a little exercise in code and we'll see some real code. Um, but let's pretend we write a little driver program and that's just this gray box here on the left. Um, and then we have some class hierarchy. So here are three class hierarchies, the, uh, the orange one, the blue one, and the green one. And we're going to instantiate an object from each of these class hierarchies 
and then hook them up or we're going to run a program. And I'm going to give you a little test. So pay close attention. Are you ready? Okay, let, let's start the program. So the program runs and it instantiates an orange object. And then it runs a little more and it instantiates a blue object. And uh, runs a little more and we instantiate a green object. Now I've showed you here what classes um, instantiated these objects. So now we call the method foo on this orange object. Where does the program counter go? Which of these classes? Do you remember? And usually someone, someone is smart in the audience will say, aha, well, it goes here. Oh, yes, very good. You remembered that that object is an instance of that class. But in just looking at the code, we can't tell. And then that method calls foo on the blue object. Well, where does that go? Well, we have the same problem. And, uh, but in fact, it goes down here and then it calls the green one. And if you remember, that was the top class. And so it's going to go here. So we can understand the individual bits. This is like reading a sentence and being able to understand the individual words but nowhere do we have a sentence. Nowhere do we have an understanding of the sentence. Nowhere can we see the use case. Where is the use case? Because that's, that's what we deliver. That's what has value. Methods are just cost. So Jeff Raskin, the creator of the Macintosh project said the interface is the program. The code is just the crap that has to go along with it to make the interface work. So the Japanese would say the little code is Muda. It's necessary Muda, but it's waste. It's the interface and the behavior that we care about. And here, there is no tie directly to that use case that our end user cares about. Well, where is the use case? Well, there it is, it's distributed across, across these classes. Now, depending exactly what class gets called, the use case will vary a little bit, but in general, the use case will be the same. Allow this airplane to take off, and it'll vary a little bit depending on you know how much luggage we have or what the destination is and so forth, but the basic use case is the same or perform this search on this database or, or do this operation in finding relationships in a family tree. I'm, I'm doing some genealogical research right now. What's important, what's key is that use case. It's a use case that has the value. And in his very earliest paper on object-oriented programming, um, Alan Kay is trying to reason about how would a child program and what that basically is, is a question of basically, how does the human mind work before it gets destroyed by computer science degrees and programming languages? And he says, you know, what, what, a, what a child is, is a problem solver. And what programming should be is an algorithm. This is all about algorithms. Now, if you had said that 20 or 30 years ago, you'd be, you'd be, uh, you would have your object-oriented uh, membership card taken away because it's supposed to be that algorithms are very, very small. They're these little methods. But Alan Kay says, no, this is about aggregate problem solving. So we want to give that use case, that algorithm, full first class citizenship. We want to give it full first class stature. So we pull together the parts of that algorithm and we make the algorithm itself a full first class programming citizen and in DCI, that's called a context. So the algorithm lives in the context. And there's one copy of the context for each new use case. And it also handles all the deviations, all the extensions on the use case. So there's basically one context per use case. But exactly what object is playing the roles in that context will vary from use case to use case. So context, we program the context in terms of another new concept called a role. 
And a role is like a use case actor. Now this looks just like programming an ordinary Java, or ordinary C++, but instead of them being classes, which are relatively static things, they're, they're slices of a use case, which dynamically will be bound onto some object of some class that is maybe not known before we run the program. So the classes or the objects may vary at runtime, but the overall use case, which is the important thing to focus on, remains the same. That's, that's static. We can read it. We can reason about it. We can analyze it. Maybe we can even formally prove it. Bunch of Eastern Europeans here. You're great on the, these formal proofs kind of things. Now we have a chance of being able to reason about code. Now let's run our program again. So we instantiate the, uh, the orange object and the blue object and the green object. And now we'll ask this context, run this use case. What the context does is it injects the logic from each of its roles into the objects that are created. So we give the objects new behavior at runtime. So this is kind of like hooking up hooking up Neo to the matrix, where, where Neo is just this blob of DNA. And now we're gonna download some program from the matrix into the mind of Neo. And all of a sudden Neo can dodge bullets or he can fly a helicopter or something like that. And now that each of these objects is intelligent with its part of the use case, we go ahead and tell it run the use case. And each one of these objects will still be able to run autonomously, but the original source code has the knowledge of the use case in it. So we can reason about the use case in the code. What is this? This is data. We still have data. We still have classes. I mean, that's, that's what machines are about. And still in architecture, it is important to have classes and maybe very shallow class hierarchies. This is part of what class-oriented programming and early object-oriented programming has given us in terms of expressiveness and in terms of what we call compression. That is to be able to talk about a large family of things like a class hierarchy in terms of a single concept, which is its base class. That gives us architectural compression. We're after compression, not abstraction. Abstraction is evil. Abstraction means to throw away information. We're not going to throw away any information. We organize the information so we can reason about it in a powerful, compact way. That's what's in the data. Then we have the context, which is where the use case lives. This is where the program becomes alive. We instantiate a context for some use case at runtime. The context will go out and it will hire or create objects, tell the objects, train the objects and what they need to do. And now we have an interaction between them. Data, context and interaction. DCI. And that's the name of this paradigm. It was initially invented um, and formalized by Trigvit Ranskog. Um, I helped him kind of make it real. I think actually the first running code in DCI was in C++. Um, he had been trying to do it and had been close in small talk. And we started this collaboration and had kind of a breakthrough and then things grew very rapidly. So this is what we're after, is returning the ability to reason about code. So let, let's see some real code here. So we start programming with roles. Roles are the individual atomic parts of, of a program, and they correspond to the things that we'll find in the human mind. How does, how does a, a, a programmer or a child, or better, an end user, think about their business world. Now, as a, as a person who's big into domain analysis, I usually think of this, think of these in terms of being the concepts that are in the business, that is, they're in the mind of the, of the domain, they're in the mind of the business. Trigvit is more of a programmer 
he likes to think of these in terms of how the programmer thinks about the business. Well, both business people and programmers are people, they're human beings. They both have mental models. Either one of these can be a way of coming up with the roles. Uh, I think a good programmer is trained to think about things in terms of the customer vocabulary. Uh, that's, that's kind of what domain-driven design tries to give us. Um, but we come up with roles. So let's say we want to do a money transfer in a bank. Well, we'll probably have roles like the source account and the destination account and then currency and some amount. So here's a destination account. And it has a, uh, a method on it called transfer from. Transfer from where? Well, from the source account. Well, where's the source account? All of these roles live together in the same context. And the context exists for this use case called money transfer. So you notice a transfer from doesn't have an argument because, well, okay, I, I just have a universe of discussion. There's, there's, there's three objects on the table. There's the source account and the destination account and the amount, and they just all know about each other. But then we divide up the responsibilities between them. So transfer from says, all right, if I'm asked to transfer from, then I'll say on, on myself, that is on this, increase balance and I give it some amount. Well, what is amount? Well, amount is this other role that's in the context that's sitting there. It's, it's part of this little play that's going on. These are like actors in a play and they're carrying out a script. This is the script for the actor destination account. There's another script for amount. There's another script for the source account. And they're just three actors on the stage who are interacting with each other to, to carry this out. So it says um, increase balance and uh, update log. All right. And uh, then we see there's a requires clause. And it says what's required of the object that implements this is that it have a method called increase balance and it have a method called update log. Well, where are those? Well, those are in the object that will play this role at runtime. So this is a role that we write at compile time that defines the script for the actor. We need to go out and find the actor and find the account that's gonna play this role at runtime. And we do that at the last microsecond, depending on whether it's a deposit account or a checking account or a uh, investment account. It can be any of those in terms of what kind of class it is. But we don't care about its class. All we care is, I guess in, in, in technical terms, about its duct type. So its duct type has to be that it has to be able to increase the balance with an argument and update the log. And then we have um, um, let's see transfer money context, which is the constructor for this, for this context. So the context is called transfer money context. Here's a constructor. And what it does is it, it takes what objects it is given. These are the objects that are going to participate in this use case. And it binds them to a role. So this assignment statement really isn't a copy, but what it does is it says, let's take the methods of source account and let's put them into this object whose name is source. So this is the hooking up Neo to the matrix. Let's give the source object source account intelligence. Let's give this destination object destination account intelligence and the same for amount. Um, here's another simple constructor that just says, look up bindings. And here's the do it function, which actually starts the enactment of the use case. And what it does to start the enactment of the use case is it just goes to the source account object. That is the object that is playing the role called source account and invokes this method called transfer to. And that kicks off 
the interactions between the objects. And now the objects take care of themselves and interact as a network to achieve the overall job. So it's not like there is a main program or a God object or an orchestration method that's orchestrating the, the methods of, of the objects. And this is what I commonly find in C++ programs is someone has all these objects and all there is is the some main object that's just calling the methods of all these other objects and they just implemented a procedural hierarchy um, and put it in a class wrapper. Uh, it's because they use test-driven development. I mean, they're forced to do this um, by the method they use. Here's a source account. And it has the, the complementary function, it has transfer to. So, I mean, this, this reads like a use case. So, um, we say, uh, here's the, the success deposit screen. So, begin transaction. If this available balance is less than an amount, then end the transaction and assert that the, the balance is unavailable. Throw an exception. Else, on self, decrease the balance. Now, what does it mean to decrease the balance? Well, it depends whether it's an investment account or a checking account. This is a method in the object itself that comes from the class of that object. We don't know this at all at compile time, but at runtime, we will make the binding to that function so that the right responsibility takes place. Then, on the destination account, increase the balance by amount. So go ask the destination account object to do something. And then on myself, update my log and tell or ask the destination account to update its log. On the display screen, display there's a success message and then end the transaction. What does the source account object require? Well, its object has to have a de decreased balance. I have to be able to ask it its available balance, and it also has an update log. Now, both of these slides are, are real code. It really runs. It's in a programming language called Trigvi, which looks curiously like Java. Um, I made it look like Java kind of as a, as a Trojan horse, so that, I mean, people can get into DCI without having to, to make a big investment in understanding. Here's a checking account. It's just a class. And it extends another class, or maybe an abstract class called account. And this is just what you'd expect it to be. So there's a default constructor that just puts 100 euro in the account. Available balance does the obvious, it's just an accessor. De decrease balance does the obvious, it's just subtracts. Um, now in a real system, this would, this would be some work with on um, transaction logs and so on and so forth. Here, this is a very simple example. Update log. We'll just print some things to a log. Increasing the balance, again, a very simple example, just adds to the local data. And available balance is of some type called, called currency. So we still have classes with their data because the domain model is important. The context represents a network of connections for a set of, of use cases of interacting objects and the roles specify the concrete interactions between them along this network and the interactions with their data. Now, instead of just saying, well, okay, you know, this is a theory, we published some papers on it. No, there, there are many projects around the world actually using this. Um, there's a large game company in the UK that's orchestrating their whole build process using a, a DCI engine. Um, I've been working with them. This is, this is immensely successful. And people are finding that it, the ability to add new use cases or to understand code uh, is extremely powerful. One of the benefits of this is I can add a new use case as a use case. And I think of it as an item that I add. So Trigvi is a pure object-oriented language. And if you, com you can compare it with Java, which just is an abstract data type language. And our intuition shows that this DCI things really work. Now, we've actually run some research. And this is the research that um, uh, Valdecantos has run at Rensselaer Poly Polytechnic Institute. Um, 
these are real programmers on real projects where we compared a, um, a control group using Java with another group using Trigby. So semantically and in terms of programming power, they're kind of the same, but one is abstract data types or ob, you know, Java programming and the other is object-oriented programming. And the results show statistically that code in Trigby supports higher compression regarding correctness and that it improves the locality of reference. So we greatly reduce context switching during software discovery. So in terms of correctness, that is just answering questions, what does this code do? Um, when we ask people questions about the Java code, they get a score of 55. When we ask them the same questions about the DCI code, they get an answer 65, a score of 65. And these are statistically significant results. Um, this is published, this is published research. If anyone's interested, contact me, I can send you the papers. If you find what's the agreement on the most central module, I mean, in Java, no one really knows. In DCI, it's clear. Everyone knows where the action is and that's where they spend their time. That reduces context switching and it's the context switching or the multitasking that kills you in programming going back and forth between windows, um, going back and forth between scopes. In DCI, you're spending most of your time in one congealed scope where all the information you need is there. So in conclusion, and this is a very, very brief summary. I mean, I give a two day course on DCI and uh, really to understand it, you, you need to try it out. Um, you can download the Trigvi programming language. It's on uh, GitHub. Um, I probably need to update it for the latest version of the JVM, um, but it was kind of a research prototype. It is very reliable. Um, it doesn't perform too bad. There are some real-time animated video game samples that come along with the, with the download. Um, but most of the original object vision in most programming languages has been lost. And the casualty isn't so much on programmers as it is on end users. The whole goal of object-oriented programming was to get into the space of the end users and think about things in terms of their vocabulary and their world so that they better can use these things. DCI restores the ability to express that original vision. It's available in a broad spectrum of programming technologies. We have ways of doing this very, very easily in Ruby. It's almost native in Ruby. Um, any flexible language with a decent reflection API will, will give you the ability to do this. The way you do it in C++ is you use its pseudo reflection API. That is, you use, you use templates and you can get very expressive code in C++. You, it's not for the weak at heart. I mean, it's, it does require some, some pretty good C++ expertise to use this effectively. The empirical results are very encouraging and uh, uh, the research still continues. So there are still additional experiments going on. So that's my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. If there's time for questions, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know where I am on my time box. But because uh, they initially you told me I had, yeah, they initially told me I had 45 minutes to talk. And then in the mail, that this whole thing was one hour to talk. So I don't know which one is right, but, but I'm, I'm available if there are questions. So, uh, Well, I, I wanted to, to ask, uh, would you recommend uh, approaching VCI in uh, statically typed languages? Because I get the feeling that it's a much better suited uh, thing for, for dynamic languages, such as, as you said. Ruby, Python, perhaps JavaScript. Well, what do you mean by a static language? I mean, I have to be a little bit careful because different people mean different things by uh, that. Good point, good point. A C Sharp. I'm, I'm a C Sharp guy myself. Okay, there are some implementations of, uh, of DCI in C Sharp. It's been a long, 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 long time since I've looked at them. Um, I recall having looked at them, they were actually pretty elegant. Uh, and I mean, C, C Sharp is just a little bit better in, than C++ in being able to give you some facilities for doing this. And so it actually ends up being uh, pretty elegant code. Um, there's a, a website called fulloo.info. 
And if you go looking there, you will probably find some pointers to some examples in C Sharp. Um, there's also a discussion group. The discussion group has been quiet for, for quite a while, but you could get on that discussion group and ask you know, for someone to either send you some code or, um, or give you a hand in doing this kind of thing in C Sharp. All right, all right. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll look into that. Uh, there's also one question. Uh, what alternative do you have to test-driven design? Uh, like testing behaviors maybe or, or something else? Alternative to domain-driven design? To, to TDD. Test-driven. I don't know. What, what problem do you... I mean, first of all, let's understand test-driven test -driven development or test-driven design is using tests to drive the design. A lot of people don't understand that, and a lot of people equate TDD with unit testing. No, unit testing is unit testing. TDD is using testing to drive your architecture. Full stop. That's why it was designed. And calling unit testing TDD doesn't make it TDD. So the alternative to TDD is to do design. Good design is based on good domain analysis. So that is understanding what the elements of the domain are. And then once having done that analysis, design becomes pretty straightforward. Um, now there's a lot of variance on this. I mean, I spent another 10 years of my life saying, once you've done your domain analysis, kind of the next step is choosing a paradigm because the world is not object shaped. And that's the multi-paradigm design stuff. So should we use databases? Should we use rules? Should we use inference engines? Should we use procedurals? Should we use functionals? Should we use objects? Well, let's just say that the whole world is object oriented. You do your domain analysis, do the analysis. It's pretty obvious what the classes will be. Now you have a whole bunch of classes that don't do anything because you haven't looked at the use cases. And now you have a customer come up and say, gee, I'd like to do this. Oh, what's your use case? Then you use DCI and you write your context and the classes are all there. You flush them out incrementally to do whatever the use case needs to do. And, uh, and you're all set, you go with it. Yeah, it, it, it really makes sense. And uh, I think your answer uh, reminds me of, I, I think it was some, some five or seven years ago, uh, when uh, Sudoku was uh, all over, uh, or 10 years ago, I don't know, somebody tried implementing uh, a Sudoku solver using TDD and they, they failed in a very public oh! way. And I, I remember this. Yeah, yep. You remember, right? Yep. And, uh, the, another person tried just, as you said, focusing on the algorithm, on, on, on the structure, on actually solving the problem, not on how the, the API should look like. And they gave a perfect solution. So, so yeah. I mean, that's, unfortunately, we, we still have this disease that we want to be nerds. And, and for all the language in the object community about being outward focused and using objects to reflect what customers really, really want, no programmer has ever talked to a customer. I mean, it's so rare. Uh, but customers, I mean, programmers will make things up and make presumptions about their customers. So understanding the end user vocabulary is very important. Now in that regard, I think you know, that domain-driven design has done us a great service. Now, there's some other parts of domain-driven design that I think are extremely wrong and really dangerous. And I mean, I have an ongoing dialogue about going on about this. Um, yes, it's, it's far too static. It really is not focused on understanding the end user. I mean, there is no analysis in domain-driven design. Read the book that says this. We do not do analysis. We go straight from our understanding of a potential solution to design. That's why it's called domain-driven design. And I think that's just stupid. It's also pretty pompous to think that we as a programmer don't need to do analysis to understand what our users want. But that's what domain-driven design is about. But at least it has a vocabulary. At least it has a vocabulary. And I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a great gift that, that DDD has given us. Um, 
I think we also have uh, another question regarding DCI and the, and the reusability. Would you say reusability is affected in any way by, by using the DCI? So reuse was a, a very popular notion in the 1970s and 1980s, and, uh, and basically it's, it's bullshit. Um, reuse is what might happen if you do good design. You don't design for reuse. All the reward mechanisms work out wrong. And I mean, there's studies and studies and studies that have been done about this. Um, in, in Bell Labs, we have this big reuse program and there were, but, but, but to be reused, it has to be used. So we had a reuse repository. I mean, some of the stuff had never been used. You know, it didn't, was, had never been used because some of it didn't compile, right? And so what, that, that's what happens if you, if you reward reuse and design for reuse. Now, if you do good domain analysis and understand the shape of your domain and what tends to be stable um, and tends to be a commodity, let's say, then you might be able to support reuse. But I think most, most reuse happens in the area of commodity software. And I mean, you just don't get any economic leverage from that beyond what you get from, from commodity economics. So everyone reuses Mac OS and everyone reuses Windows. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, 90% of the code in your application is reused because you're reusing Windows or you're reusing uh, Mac OS. Well, so what? Um, then people try to say, well, you know, I'm going to gild the lily and find an extra 10% here or there for some classes I can build. It just, it doesn't work. Um, there's a lot of research on this by Will Trace, who used to be at, at uh, IBM Loral Federal Systems Division in, in New York. Um, but basically, a lot of the claims are, shall I say, hopes of Prieto Diaz and these advocates of reuse in the 1980s uh, are poppycock. It's... Uh, I mean, of course I reuse, I mean, I reuse semicolons all the time. Now, one of the problems of Trigvit is Trigvit doesn't have semicolons. Semicolons are optional. So I've actually reduced the amount of reuse you can do at Trigvit because I've gotten rid of semicolons. You can't, you can't reuse them, so. Yeah, I, I noticed some of the lines uh, had the, <laughs> were ending with spaces. I was wondering what's, uh, <laughs> what's that about? Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, th I don't have any other questions. Don't know if you then uh, spotted something else. I think it's um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, some things that need to be uh, yeah, let us sink in. And um, but uh, indeed, it's uh, it was a very interesting talk. And uh, I don't know if I look at your examples, uh, James. And I remember so. Versus in college, I did, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, exercises in object-oriented programming and uh, labs and uh, things. And then, so I used to do a lot with the, I don't know, abstract classes, inheritance and behaviors in classes. But then I was surprised when I uh, got my first job and then uh, started to do things in production of uh, how little of, I don't know, those uh, classes or objects had behaviors in them. Because actually, that's there right. was like a transfer object, but then you use a different class to uh, yeah, call methods that use those objects. Yep. So yeah, it, no, it, that's, it, just, that's it just struck me now. <laughs> ah, if people are interested in pursuing this further, there's a book called Lean Architecture by my wife and I, Gertrude. She's around here somewhere. Uh, there's this website, follow.info. Uh, if you want to follow up on this more, um, uh, send, me, send me an email and I'll be glad to, uh, to get you pointed or, uh, in the right direction or to get, to get uh, trivia downloaded from, uh, from uh, GitHub. Uh, if there's any aspiring uh, undergraduate researcher out there who wants to do some work, if you want to take over or help me with uh, the, uh, the trivia implementation, upgrade it for... Uh, all the current uh, Java and, uh, and uh, Eclipse and so on and so forth <laughs> garbage. Um, I'm more than happy to give that job to somebody. So uh, looking for some volunteers if there's any available. All right, so yeah, I'm a, like Vlad, I'm a, a C-sharp uh, person myself, uh, but then I'm, I think uh, 
30-40% at least of our audience it's, uh, is Java. So. Yeah, well, I had to learn Java. I mean, I took two or two or three days and learned Java to do this thing. It's written in Java. Um, but I mean, any programmer who's a professional programmer should be able to deal with it. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, I guess, a Ruby person. Um, but well, I guess, actually, most of my programming is in Objective-C these days. <laughs> um, but uh, and a little bit in, uh, in some of the other Apple languages. But yeah, I love Ruby. I, I don't have to admit, uh, I don't know, it's, um, yeah, I mainly programmed in C Sharp, but then, yeah, I also touch other languages and I can uh, read fairly easily. Most pro but Objective-C, I think, is one of the hardest uh, uh, languages to read for me. I don't know why. I, just, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But, I mean, I've learned to live with it and I, I've learned to watch out for myself and to... Uh, so I can be very effective in it, but it, it is, uh, uh, wow. I mean, if, if, if I was a bad boy during my life and I get sent to hell and I get a programming job in hell, it will be in Objective-C. I, I know this. Have you tried PowerShell? Uh, <laughs> PowerShell? No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I was actually reading some uh, some analysis recently about the Objective C, in that it's not, it's not designed to, um, uh, to to make developers feel good about writing code. It's designed about uh, getting them to to deliver uh, well performing apps. And yeah, you you deliver a well performing app, but you cry all the way through through release. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't get too religious about programming languages. I mean, you give me any programming language and I mean, like I say, you get, they give me Java and I hate Java even worse. Java is just abysmal. I mean, who, who, what insane mind conceived of that child's toy? What a useless piece of crap. And I struggled with that all the time, but I mean, heck, I mean, I can make, I can make the elephant dance. Um, Actually, if you compare Objective-C and Swift, I'll take Objective-C over Swift, even though Swift is much more elegant. And when I'm done with a Swift program, it's more likely to run because, I mean, they're making sure I don't have any null pointers. I mean, it's Swift, Swift has one good idea, which is we're going to make it impossible for you to, have, to use null pointers, right? So it's like there's it this null pointer fetish that, that underlies, and it makes programming as painful and pa as painful as, 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 as you can imagine. And somehow I get a lot more done a lot more quickly in Objective-C than I do in Swift. Um, though Swift clearly is a much more advanced, much more elegant language. And uh, I have done a significant amount of code in Swift. I have a, a very complex app for the iPad that's written in Swift. Um, but wow, um, that, and I'm proud of it. I mean, the result is really beautiful. But wow, it was a lot of work getting that result. And I'm not clear that the end product has a higher quality than it would have if I'd done it in Objective-C. So like I say, I don't think programming language is the big lever. I think the big lever comes in conceptualization. And that's why I like what you guys are doing in, in having the architecture focus in this conference. I like things like DCI, which are at the conceptual level, instead of finding over syntax and, uh, and fighting over individual libraries. Um, it, it's, about, it's, about, it's about people, it's about how people communicate and to make that work and need these great conceptualizations. And I mean, I can do object-oriented programming in Fortran if, I, if you put a gun to my head. Um, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, we, we all should take a step back and not argue about whether to use tabs or spaces, even though spaces are clearly superior. But, <laughs> but <laughs> just, just focus <laughs> on, on the end goal. Yeah, I, I, uh, so I, this really resonates with me. I, I do get the feeling that, uh, at least in my case, being, look, for, uh, for example, uh, with my C-sharp background, recently, in the past years, I've been doing Python. And I find myself writing C-sharp code in Python, 
you know, with CSR yep, yep, paradigms. Yep, yep, yep. And I need to just take a step back. Okay, that's that's not how you do it in the dynamic language. Let's 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 see. So I think for for me at least, it's a conscious effort to to adapt to the paradigms of the language I'm developing. Yeah. And that may be my problem in Swift. There may be something that like I'm just fundamentally missing. And what I'm trying to do is program Objective C with Swift uh, syntax and Swift semantics. Um. And maybe I should just break down and uh, take a course sometime or get a mentor and do some pair programming for a couple of days. Um, there may be something I'm missing for all I know. On the other hand, I've probably written, I don't know, 20,000 lines of Swift code. So uh, uh, you'd think I would, have, I would have stumbled over it by now, so. It's probably Swift. So. Yeah. All right, James, well, once again, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I think we could be talking for hours here and it would be great. But uh, we do need to jump to the other session. Hope you'll uh, respond to another one of our invitations sometime in the future. <laughs>